All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon, uh, wherever you are or wherever you may be in the world. Um, this is our one year anniversary of the Tunney F. Lee Memorial Lecture Series. And I'm so happy with the participation that we've seen so far. And I'm really looking forward to future seminars that we've got planned for 2022 as well. As a start, I want to say thank you to Jack Chen for being here with us today and to all of you attending. And of course, our sponsors and donors who have made this possible. I'd like to thank, thank our founders level in no particular order, which includes Joe and Selena Chow, York Lowe, Amy Goon, Paul Lee, the South Cove Community Health Center, Thomas and May Chin, Helen Chin Shikta, the Boston Foundation, Tufts Medical Center, and the Margaret Wong Family Foundation. Um, I'll now introduce Jack Chen, who will be speaking today. Um, Jack Chen is a historian, curator, and dumpster diver. He's a teacher and surfacing the, dis the disappeared stories of other systems of power and wealth. He's the current Clement A. Price Professor of Public History and Humanities and Director of the Price Institute on Ethnicity, Cultures, and the Modern Experience at Rutgers, New York. He's the founding director of the Asian Pacific American Studies Program and Institute at New York University. And he co-founded the Museum of Chinese in America in New York. Um, he's been working on anti-Asian xenophobia and he had worked also on the two hour PBS documentary, The Chinese Exclusion Act. And an exhibition at the New York Historical Society led him to focus on intersectional history of American eugenics. Via a series of exhibits, uh, conferences and performances, he's been retelling New York US history from the lens of Nordic eugenics hierarchies of fit elite white Protestants versus the world's unfit others. And with that, I will introduce Jack and yield the uh, camera to him. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. It's it's. I, I wish I could see you, and I wish we could be together in maybe a banquet hall um, where I know you oftentimes will hold your events. But I hope you've all been well, and it's been a very difficult uh, year and a half. Um, but uh, you know the the subjects that we're talking about and the issues that the Chinese Historical Society of New England has been working on continue to be of, of great importance. And for me, it's a great honor to be speaking uh, with, um, uh, with the Tunney uh, Lee uh, lecture series. Um, last time uh, I was in Boston, I had a chance to spend some time with Tunney and he came down to New York afterwards. So I, I really um, miss him, uh, but it's a great honor to be speaking in his name. I should first say that the reason I'm uh, wearing this hat and wearing my heavier um, uh, winter gear is that I'm up in Maine, uh, the land of the Abenaki, the land of the morning dawn, uh, pretty far east, far farther east than Boston, and therefore the sun uh, arrives uh, arrives earlier uh, in this part of the in this part of the world. But also, I want to acknowledge the indigenous Native American. Uh, presence and um, on, ongoing kind of uh, 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 really impact on the land. And this is true certainly for the part of the, the country, the Mid-Atlantic that I live in, which is the land of the Muncie Lenape peoples, both in Northern New Jersey and New York. I live in Brooklyn. And the two groups are interrelated, um, not only by being part of the same language family uh, that the French would call Algonquian, but also in terms of the deep history of the glacial impacts in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic. So um, uh, I also want to um, kind of uh, reference uh, Arundhati Roy, who's a fantastic uh, writer uh, from India. Uh, but uh, when she spoke of uh, the pandemic portal, which I encourage you to kind of look up that essay she wrote, she wrote a very particular part of it saying that uh, during these times uh, of great global, uh, of the great global pandemic, uh, it's not only a moment of great tragedy, of course, with the, with so many people being sick and, and dying, and it being, it, it affecting all over the world. But it's also a moment to reflect and take stock of what we're doing, what where we've been. And in some ways, this moment is a is a time in which all of a sudden the rush and craziness of the world especially kind of slows down. Now, I know we're further into the um, the effort to try to get back to business as usual, but there are certain good things about 
everything's slowing down, everything's uh, stopping in the sense that it gives us a chance to reflect. It gives us a chance to kind of get back out into nature and into the world and begin to kind of think about what's important in life and what's important in terms of uh, where we stand and what we're doing with all of our busyness. So in some ways it's, it's slowing down our lives and it's in a similar way to slow cooking, uh, making food at home, not just rushing around, grabbing fast food all the time. It gives us a chance to think about the past and our connection to the past. It gives us a chance to think about place and time. So how do we then in some ways um, honor that and honor that in the name of Tani Lee, who of course was very much concerned about place and time. He was the, um, uh, of course, he was a, a great urban planner uh, who's at MIT uh, and played a very important role in Massachusetts, but especially Boston. Uh, and of course, uh, was much beloved in Boston's Chinatown. And uh, he's left the legacies of the, the map that he's created, which is so much more than a map. It's also about family stories. And I'm sure many of you were uh, working with Tani in that work. But I also think of him as, um, as a brother in so many ways. Uh, it turns out that uh, he was uh, 20 years older than me. He would have been 90 um, this year. Uh, I just turned 70, I can't believe it. Um, so in some ways there's that kind of connection of, of um, being part of an older generation and also being connected in terms of our interest and, and, and commitment to Chinatowns and why they exist. Uh, but it's also um, kind of a, a linkage in terms of understanding the importance of history. And it's not so much an abstract history, but it's actually a history linked to our lives. So as, um, as many of you know, Tunney's uh, great-great-grandfather worked on the railroads. And that's significant in many ways, but one of them is that, of course, the story goes, and we know that Chinese and Irish uh, were hired by contractors, by, uh, by those railroad magnets and, and fi uh, financial interests on the East Coast, but also the emerging interests in the West Coast. So Stanford, for example, and Crocker, names that are very familiar with those people in California, were linked actually to uh, the investors in the East Coast. Uh, Harriman, for example, and the Harriman family were deeply involved in the um, railroad interests. And of course, the steel interests, building, uh, creating the steel that would then uh, be used in the building of the railroad uh, lines themselves and the railroad locomotives themselves, were a complex um, organization of uh, those elites who had wealth and power, uh, basically hiring uh, labor, uh, quote unquote, cheap labor, Irish and Chinese, to actually do the work of building the railroad lines themselves. Um, and there's a deeper history to railroads um, that we could talk about, but I'm not going to go there. But I wanted to kind of focus on the fact that it was his great grandfather. And then, uh, and, and then he, he uh, returned uh, to um, his great grandfather was in the US and the railroads, uh, working on the railroads in the 1860s. And then, as I understand it, he returned to the US. He left for a while, returned in 1892, and became a laundryman in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. And it's there that the great grandfather joined uh, uh, Tony's father. Now, I'm not sure I have all the generations right. I was kind of quickly looking up this information, so some of you may want to correct me. But what's key here, I think, is that we're talking about generations uh, in which he was connected to and he connected to actively in terms of his active effort to try to uh, think about the history of Chinese in this country. And for him, it wasn't abstract. It wasn't a textbook effort of learning. It was actually directly connected to uh, his own family and through the Toisan lineage that he had. Uh, so there's so much more to learn about from someone like Tani because of that personal connection. And I'm sure many of you involved in the historical society also have those personal connections. Uh, for me, I'll just briefly mention uh, the connection that, um, uh, that I would not be born if it wasn't for the Chinese exclusion laws and then for the uh, eugenics laws that uh, passed the immigration law of 1924, which set a quota so that when the 19, 
40, in, when in 1943, the Chinese exclusion law was repealed, so-called repealed, it defaulted to 105 people a year of Chinese who were allowed to come in. And that 105 people was really meant to be a 2% um, uh, number set at the 1890 immigration uh, level. So that's why 105, but for European groups where you had millions coming in of Italians and Jews, it was set also at 2%. So that eugenics law linked Chinese exclusion because it emboldened those who are really freaking out that there are so many uh, inferior Europeans coming into their United States, the Protestants, uh, that they felt that they had to dramatically uh, decrease, restrict, if not exclude uh, those inferior people. So the Chinese exclusion laws embolden them to actually extend it to quote unquote inferior Europeans in favor of the so-called Nordic peoples. So in many ways, when we look at the history of Boston, for example, which I know Tani and you all have devoted so much of your energies in, in trying to understand and document, it's also looking at the history of the Irish in Boston, and of course their struggles with uh, trying to establish themselves in relationship to the Boston Brahmins or the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, many of them who came from Puritan and other kind of Protestant backgrounds. Now we're gonna circle back to that because it's actually quite important to understand why this process of thingification, why this process of objectification of Chinese in the, in the ways that we are uh, reminded of regularly most recently, of course, this, uh, these past um, 19 months, there's been a dramatic increase of anti-Asian violence, uh, much of it being targeted in a personal way against elderly, against uh, oftentimes uh, those who were vulnerable in positions of um, being knocked over, uh, being hurt, and in many cases, also uh, too many cases in being, um, in being killed. And uh, if you recall the incident that happened in Atlanta, in the outskirts by the uh, outlying suburbs in which the man who had, uh, who had been accused of killing uh, those many women, uh, the Korean women, uh, again, this is anti-Asian violence and yellow peril at work, but what was said by the police uh, chief who had um, been involved in arresting him is that he was basically saying this guy was an okay guy, a regular guy, but he was having a bad day. So what does the question of having a bad day mean in terms of why Asians can be targeted um, in the United States so easily? And I think this is a question of public history. It's not simply an academic exercise in which we go into the archives and research it, but it's really an issue in which we as a people must, must grapple with together. And this is really part of the legacy of Tunney in that he believed in kind of public scholarship. And why that scholarship was important was because it actually helped people. It helped people in Chinatown, it helped descendants of people who have been here for generations, but it also is an ongoing uh, project of helping people who are living and trying to make a living today in trying to understand what the culture and the politics of this country are about. So that's what I thought I would talk a little bit more about and, um, and then explore and come back around to why this history actually has an ongoing uh, significance and impact uh, to us today. Um, I'll just say a little bit about my research, um, because I'll be referencing uh, this research uh, just a little bit while I'll be, while I'll be speaking. Um, one of the first projects I did was um, to produce a book called New York Before Chinatown. And in that book, I was really looking at how uh, Chinatowns began to emerge to begin with, and to look beyond the, th the thought that it was simply when the first Chinese began to arrive into a Northeastern port. Uh, that happened, if we were to really look at it, before there was even a California. So the idea that somehow the gold rush, 
in California, precipitated um, the early Chinese uh, arrivals and the early Chinese relationships to North America. Well, it's really only part of the story because those of, those of us in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic know that the story of Chinese in the Americas and the perception of Chinese in the Americas really begins with the China trade. This happens up and down the coast, certainly from Salem to Boston, uh, to New York, New York Harbor, where, which became the major harbor of the nation in which the China trade um, was trafficked, but also, of course, down to Philadelphia, Baltimore, and even down to Charleston. So that uh, what we have here is an earlier history that really begins with the founding of the new nation. So that's what I was trying to tackle in the New York before Chinatown. And I'll get back to that in a second as to why that trade and why the representations and images of um, Chinese as also goods or things, uh, porcelain ware, for example, why were uh, Chinese called uh, Chinamen and why were the people who sewed these porcelains also referred to as Chinamen? How did things China wear in some ways take the place of people. Um, the second study I've done um, for quite a while is really around the phenomenon of Chinese exclusion, but also of yellow peril and how the anti-Chinese um, agitation that happened that culminated in the exclusion laws uh, also then spread out and it impacted other quote unquote Asiatics. And therefore, how was the very term Asiatics or Asian or yellow for that matter, extended to more and more groups of people. Uh, and that continues to be a flexible category to this day, as we know, where increasingly Muslims, South Asians, um, and uh, other folks, even in West Asia, what we call West Asia, uh, a colleague and friend of mine, uh, who's Palestinian actually actively identifies as being Asian as well. So if we were to cross the Straits of, uh, of, of, um, of Istanbul and go from the west side of that, uh, of that river and go across to the eastern side, that is said to be by Europeans to be the point in which Asia begins, right? So there's this kind of imagined other that Asia has always represented. So yellowness in some ways represents that construction historically. Um, but also more recently, the question of uh, eugenics and what does eugenics have to do with um, that kind of hierarchy of different groups. So how do, for example, the Irish who are considered, who are not considered white uh, and were considered in some ways the quote unquote uh, niggers of Europe, how do they become white in North America and how do they operate in the pecking order of eugenics in terms of not being Protestant, but also being uh, increasingly becoming white in the context of uh, Chinese, for example, and African Americans, et cetera, et cetera. So we're talking about kind of a complex arc in which the position of Chinese and the position of those who are considered outside the boundaries of acceptable Americanness are formulated and played with. It's a, it's a more complicated dynamic process, but it can be understood uh, historically, especially it could be understood within what we can call the political culture or the culture of America. So when someone says that person had a, had a hard day, had a rough day, and therefore that justifies somehow why uh, they went on a killing spree um, in a civilian, in a US context, that's part of the political culture in which all these bits and pieces of history, um, was that person uh, a war veteran? Was that person someone who had a father who fought in Vietnam, who referred to Vietnamese as gooks? Um, how does that history itself relate to, let's say Chinese in America? And how uh, did that family, but also the town that person grew up in and the, and the culture in which that person grew up within uh, think about otherness and who are others in which violence is an acceptable norm to project or to enact onto somebody, uh, onto someone. So what's the culture in which uh, there's a certain kind of acceptability 
of those kinds of relationships that can happen. And therefore, what are certain groups? Certainly they are. There certainly there are certain groups who are more vulnerable and more susceptible to those kinds of cultural logics of who is another and who is someone that one can act against without um, quite so much the fear and sanction of the law or the fear and sanction of somehow um, the norms of that culture. Um, so when we're talking about um, othering in those ways, we're talking about war, we're talking about what's acceptable within the United States, who is considered uh, un-American or who is considered a foreigner by default. Uh, so of course that gets into the realm of many groups of people, but that also gets into the deeper historical question of how does that actually operate. So I'm just going to briefly touch on some of this and kind of get at the deeper roots of how that actually happens. Part of it happens through what I can call the process of thingification, thing, things being produced by certain places outside of the bounds of the country uh, or inside the bounds of a country. And in some ways, the people who are producing them become identified with the same as those things. So in the case of... Um, uh, Chinese porcelains or Chinese silks or Chinaware, quote unquote, porcelainware itself, from the very beginning of the foundation of the United States, but even earlier during the colonial period, Chinese porcelains, Chinaware, become increasingly identified with the people who made them. Uh, they're all foreign, they're all brought in. There's actually very little contact with Chinese people themselves. So, in some ways, the Chinaware stands in for that imagined other that is desired, but also many of those things are disposable. So from year to year, um, when the chinaware becomes chipped uh, and the set gets broken up and people then with wealth especially decide that they're gonna buy the latest, um, the latest fashion of chinaware, the latest patterns, then um, what gets, uh, what gets um, uh, given away or thrown away is really last year's fashion. So things are disposable increasingly in the US context um, in which there's unbridled wealth and people are feeling that, well, we can always just replace it. Now, of course, the problem with that is that this form of objectification also means that people can be become very vulnerable to that logic. In other words, uh, the large numbers of cheap laborers, cheap quote unquote laborers from China uh, are bec become equated with disposability, uh, but also in times of war, when increasingly those who are, um, uh, who are, who are bombed, uh, both civilians, uh, but also the quote unquote enemy, um, become increasingly quantified as numbers uh, that may be reported in the news. Um, I grew up during the Vietnam War, and that's really the earliest way in which I started developing kind of a critical consciousness into the portal of the war to begin to understand how Asians were becoming um, objectified through war numbers and statistics on a daily level, but also how I became objectified increasingly, even though I was an American citizen, born in the soil, on the soil of the United States, that I was also being objectified, um, despite the fact that I technically have been an American and was an American. So these questions of how thingification happens, I think has a historical root, and we can kind of talk about that quite a bit. I think many scholars are working on this, but in many ways, it's also a practical kind of question as to why is it that this violence happens? And why is it that uh, Asians are not truly uh, truly treated as having full personhood. And the stories of full human beings, whether it's in the media, on television or movies, is still not fully accepted and acknowledged as part of what American culture is about. Occasionally there'll be a breakthrough, but it's a very stubborn kind of wall that hasn't been quite uh, uh, taken down uh, yet. And it's an issue that I think all of us struggle with when we see not only the extreme violence, but also the everyday aggressions that can happen and the everyday assumptions that can happen um, that are really uh, assuming that somehow uh, all Asians, but Chinese in this country, 
are de facto foreigners and de facto somehow um, not aware of uh, what being an American truly is. So um, we can talk about this at greater length. I'm happy to kind of um, talk about it more, but I wanted to connect what I just said to a deeper problem, which is something that someone like Alexander Hamilton or Benjamin Franklin or even George Washington really were true believers in. And that's the framing in which political arithmetic was used as a underlying logic as to why certain things were done and how in some ways um, countries and peoples in those countries were treated. So when this country was reeling from the, uh, from the British, the, from the War of Independence with the British, and in a place like New York, the whole city was burned down, uh, uh, the, the country was in bad debt, and uh, people like Alexander Hamilton sought to grow the wealth of the country to get it, New York City and the country out of debt by basically trade. And he spoke of the trade as political arithmetic. Uh, Benjamin Franklin also thought of what were the usable things that somehow the United States could adopt from certain kinds of, let's say, chickens in China or other parts of the world that would be um, re that would be uh, pr uh, you know kind of uh, uh, animal stock that they could grow readily in the United States and make wealth. But also, what were the natural resources that could be exploitable to turn be turned into uh, commodities uh, to change for the desired things, such as silks and porcelains, and uh, those things are, that were coveted by the wealthy people. People were willing to pay a lot of money for those materials. So this exchange system becomes part of political arithmetic, but it's more than that. George Washington, for example, was also a practitioner of this because um, he, his father, and his brother were surveyors. And part of the arithmetic that we're talking about is the quantification of land being claimed during the colonial occupation, uh, settler colonialism of the British uh, in the new world. And by surveying the land that laid the basis of a legal claim of colonists to say that this parcel of land is something I'm purchasing or I'm getting deeded through the legal system. And against the indigenous peoples, of these regions, whether they be Abenaki or Muncie Lenape peoples, their lands become increasingly dispossessed. And the resources, the, the quote unquote resources, natural resources on their lands become quantified in ways that are claimed and brought into the political arithmetic system. So in many ways, that's part of how we can begin to understand how uh, people, but also trees and also lands become increasingly treated as objects of consumption, as things uh, that are divorced from the larger uh, context in which they are operating within. Uh, Chinese uh, laborers, Chinese quote unquote coolies become increasingly treated as objects of trade, objects of manipulation in a way that's similar to enslaved peoples. Now I'm not saying those processes were exactly the same and that the experience certainly was not the same as enslavement, but they're related and they're all related by certain logics of political arithmetic. Um, so I can go on about that as well. Um, but what I wanna do is talk about how this kind of dehumanization uh, through um, numbers and quantification, objectification process, processes that are part of uh, settler colonialism then become kind of global and viral. So that what happens, for example, in England as it expands its empire into Ireland, for example, is directly related to what happens in the United States and what happens in China as well, but also other places in which uh, Anglo colonialism really expands. And also when Anglo-American colonialism or imperialism through trade begins to expand, similar logics of quantification, objectification, and basically um, power being exercised through that kind of process begins to happen more and more. <clears throat> 
So um, in a quick way, we can understand, for example, those who are resisting that process from happening, those who are rebelling as being kind of castigated as somehow an enemy of the political culture. So we're all familiar with the representations of Fu Manchu, for example, as representing that exotic oriental evil, the dangerous, sinister oriental male who is really resisting um, the West, for example. Uh, the more recent example of that, when we look at the Marvel version of um, the Yellow Peril story, of course, it's about Shang-Chi, who's the son, uh, the good son of the evil Mandarin. Uh, which itself was a shift away from Shang-Chi being the son of Fu Manchu to uh, a Marvel book character. But the point is the same because we have this um, binary between the evil father and then the good son. And in many ways, historically, those of you who are older and familiar with uh, early American films, for example, you have not only Fu Manchu, which was a film version of the novel, the British novel. But also we have Charlie Chan, who was the Honolulu detective, who was always helping the white man solve the crimes um, that uh, somehow he gets brought into. So there's the good Chinaman who's helping out the white man, and then there's a bad Chinaman who's trying to keep the, uh, keep the West at bay and to fight directly against um, the, uh, the Western and British interests. Um, so you have that similarity with the uh, binary of the dragon lady, um, the very aggressive uh, female who is, um, can emasculate men, uh, is alluring, very attractive, but at the same time is not good for the white family. And then you also have the image of the geisha in an Asian American context in which the woman is totally accommodating to the white man and the wishes of the white man. These are complex issues. I'm not going to get into them in a great deal, but we're talking about a political culture and in many ways, a historical archive of these kinds of images that are deep, deep, deep within the political culture of the United States, but also the Anglo-American imagination as it's spread out around uh, the world. So in many ways, anti-Chinese violence can be kind of understood uh, within that kind of context of the good Chinaman, of uh, the good Asian, of the bad Asian, and the interest of political arithmetic, which is really an exercise of how wealth and power can expand uh, around the world into new nations, into the United States, into the ports that emerge, Boston, New York, uh, but also in California and the building of the railroads, those who are, who are cooperating and helpful and those who are not. Um, and then I really want to get into where does that come from itself? And I'm just, I'm just aware of our time being pretty tight. So I'm gonna kind of quickly go over this, but it's not like these ideas emerged in the United States by themselves alone. Uh, political arithmetic was an idea that this person by the name of William Petty, who was a British uh, citizen, uh, an Englishman, who then became uh, an important surveyor of Ireland. And this is at a point in which, in the 1600s, in which uh, there had been already a century, uh, well, uh, almost a century of British colonial occupation of Ireland. Now we can talk about this at great length, but the important thing here is to understand that as the British colonized Ireland, they also basically um, destroyed its forest, the oak forest, in which um, runic and Irish culture uh, sprang from. The vast oak forests that were throughout Ireland um, were basically cut down in a relatively short amount of time of British occupation. Those oak forests became um, the hulls and the, and the infrastructures for ships and the British Navy. But also, of course, they were turned into the oak paneling for the wealthy British themselves. Of course, you just don't have to look past more than Downton Abbey, the film, the TV series, the BBC TV series, to appreciate these huge manors, these beautiful homes that we tend to kind of romanticize today, but to understand where that oak came from and where what, what happened to the Irish people in the colonization process. Not only were their forests taken, but also 
their culture was also occupied and dominated. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning William Petty is that he is someone who was brought in to survey uh, Ireland after this deforestation had happened to transfer the lands that the Irish had to um, the British army and also to the financial investors in, uh, in Ireland itself. And it's really Petty who begins to formulate what political arithmetic is about. And we get the idea that arithmetic is somehow a science, but in fact, arithmetic is really a way of using numbers to, um, to help the powers that be of the British financiers, but also the British aristocracy in actually dominating um, Ireland as a colony. So they're not only extracting the oak trees, but they're also increasingly using these logics as a way to dominate the culture and people themselves. So they start coming up with population statistics, ways of understanding how can you quote unquote domesticate or acculturate or actually transmute was the actual word that was used. How can you begin to transmute um, the Irish people into ones who are allies in um, the British colonial efforts? Now, I mentioned this very briefly because we know that these very same things are happening as the British expand into other colonies around the world. Um, I was brought up with basically stories about the opium wars and how the British waged opium uh, into China as a way to balance out the trade so they can get more of those porcelains and more of those silks. Um, so in some ways, there are variations of pattern of how wealth and power is developed, but how things were always the source of this kind of bartering and exchange process in which power power was being expressed um, in that exchange as really a form of domination with colonialism. So things, anti-Chinese violence, um, and treating uh, these people who are far away and a number increasingly quantified as disposable or manipulable. In other words, these numbers were meant to be increased in certain ways and the resistance that these people had to uh, domination was meant to be decreased by numbers. So power was really exercised in those kinds of ways. Now, um, I'm just gonna bring this back really quickly to Boston. And in many ways, this brings us to Tunney Lee's work um, in a certain way, because of course, Chinatown in Boston emerges during a certain time out of the China trade and how the very first Chinese arrive uh, in many ways through the China trade. And, but they're, always, they're also coming and arriving into Boston in the context of Irish and the Brahmins, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who are battling for control of this urban area. The Irish, of course, are reeling, reeling in terms of coming out of the um, colonization process Many of them are coming out of the potato famines, which can be understood in the context of this deforestation process in which their traditional means of livelihood are basically taken away dramatically and that the lands and waters are heavily denuded of any kind of life. So they're desperate to find another place to survive and they follow the pathways of the British empire and colonization building to find a place in places like New York, uh, but also Boston. And that that fight between the Irish and the memory that the Irish have of British occupation, British colonization, is still very much alive as people enter Boston. And also the Chinese are arriving. And of course, the Chinese and the Irish were involved in building the railroads for the wealthy financial interests of both people in New York and Boston, uh, but also in California. So we have this kind of complex in which the Irish... Brahmin and Chinese stories are actually embedded in a place like Boston. And the memories of those struggles and fights are also embedded with these families. So in many ways, I think Tani Lee represents that legacy, that memory, that act of connection with these deeper histories. And it's really a history in which uh, political arithmetic uh, becomes so much a part of why those power relationships ended up the, the way they had ended up but it also embeds in this kind of um, set of relationships in the political culture 
uh, how Yellow Peralism, how Chinatown, and also how both Irish and Chinese were actually objectified and thought of as lesser than human, lesser than what was deserving of full ownership and full involvement in the political culture of the Anglo-American Protestant culture. Um, so um, I'm gonna just kind of quickly end there, but I'm really happy to talk um, uh, you know, to any questions that people have. But I guess what I wanna say is that part of what's so important about Tunney is that he began to reconstruct the generations of stories that his family um, uh, had of the United States. These stories that generally to this day have not been told. So in many ways, his, he was in the pivot point between three generations ahead of him. He could talk about his uh, father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather. And I think he had the same vision uh, about the generations after him as well. And I think even through, as evident through the formation of the Chinese Historical Society of New England, there are generations of Chinese in New England who were directly impacted by Tunney and the kind of work that he did and now the legacy of his lecture, but also the map that he created of Chinatown and the stories that were told in that map. So in an interesting way, I think he speaks to the seven generations idea that the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois Confederacy people talk about in terms of how do you then do the memory work? We're not talking about academia here. We're talking about the memory work of a person who is connected to seven generations and thinking about the interests of seven generations. So it's really with that, that I think Tunney's um, understanding of history and why it's important was also one of public history and also one of engagement and serious engagement with, with uh, what's in the best interests of a community and how violence, objectification, but also anti-Asian and anti-Chinese racism actually happen and are trying to learn from that in a way that can actually fight against that from continuing to happen in the future. I'm just gonna end there. I'm really happy to uh, talk um, and respond to any questions that you may have. So thank you. So thank you, Jack. Uh, I think we have one question from the, the q and I don't know if you can see that one uh, regarding the kind of current political narrative, how that's developing and uh, how the demonization and the fear of others is, you know, shaping current uh, tropes. So, if you don't mind, elaborate on on that one. Sure, I actually don't see the question, but I'm happy to um, to respond to that. Um, I mean, there are many ways that we can talk about it, and I'd be kind of interested in maybe uh, whoever was asking the question, but also others to kind of go into it more. Um, but it seems, in a broad way, uh, from um, from questions about Chinese technology, from questions about um, uh, uh, kind of Chinese involvement, the Chinese state's involvement in global warming, um, but also in terms of uh, recently, there were uh, Chinese planes that, that had been flown, that were flying over Taiwan airspace. All of these kinds of questions have actually converged rather dramatically over the past number of years as a consistent anti-Chinese perspective. And those of us who are older realize that in many ways after, um, after Nixon and Kissinger were in China and um, that kind of dramatic change in terms of the negativity and the virulence of anti-Chinese feelings shifted towards this idea that China can be good for America, again, this kind of binary of the good Chinaman and the bad Chinaman, the good China and the bad China, it shifted almost like overnight, in which all of a sudden people were uh, going to get the banquet, right? Trying to get the banquet um, that uh, Nixon had when he went to visit China. So we've gone from a moment of this kind of romantic involvement with China, but also the emergence of uh, China's economy basically saving America's economy. I mean, we could talk about that, but without China's trade and quote unquote cheaper goods, um, in many ways, that would not have allowed for the incredible expansion of the American, uh, American economy, even when America 
was starting to produce less and less of its own um, goods and materials. In some ways, they're both conjoined. So for a while, there's a lot of discussion about um, China and the US actually being uh, conjoined twins um, in which they were kind of uh, uh, linked uh, economically, but also increasingly they were together were gonna help build a new global um, uh, economy together. And that shift that's happened now, and we can see it in terms of even as the quote unquote China virus is being exploited, that whole idea, uh, but also to seeing China as an economic enemy, but also China as a military enemy. Um, we're in very dangerous times, I think, in terms of how there's a new Asian enemy emerging. They're no longer Muslims in quite the same way, or maybe they're gonna be Muslims and Chinese at the same time. So I think we're entering a dangerous period. And in many ways, it's one in which um, it's very easy uh, for the American public to be in some ways manipulated because there's such a deep archive or a deep, a deep tradition of anti-Asianness of one kind or another that it could be shifted from one group to another group, from being against Japan to being against China, to being against Korea, to being against uh, Vietnam, to being against the Philippines, on and on and on to Muslims. So that kind of uh, interchangeability or disposability mm -hmm. of one Asian to another Asian is really part of this, from my point of view, thinkification process, this objectification, this way in which of treating Asia's Asians, peoples as basically interchangeable numbers or um, interchangeable enemies or interchangeable allies who are, you, who are helping the American interest in expanding and growing wealthy. Um, so I think it's important to kind of try to imagine these moments, not as random moments, but actually as interconnected in a pattern that operates. So, so kind of follow on on that topic is, um, would you say that the current uh, anti, you know, Asian sentiment is worse than say, even in the 50s and 60s during the Cold War right, against Ch Communist China and Vietnam, Viet Cong? Uh, and how, how would you see the pendulum swinging back, right, to the mm -hmm. friendly, what, what might it tick for that too. To wow, well, that's, uh, yeah, York, that's a great question. And <laughs> um, I, I think it's something that really deserves a lot of discussion and thinking through um, with not just so-called experts or people who study it, but really it's something that we all have to be thinking through. I think the stakes have never been higher, um, certainly with the global pandemic and which with mm -hmm. globalization and the interlocking nature of the global economy now being greater than it ever was. China has been a big reason for that and the United States investment and European investments in China and their corporations, uh, our corporations being heavily involved in making funds through the Chinese labor and the Chinese factories that are there, but also them proliferating throughout different places of Asia for that um, uh, greater profitability or keeping that profitability you know, from place to place to place. Um, but this not only includes the so-called cheap goods, but it also includes luxury goods, right? We know that, Asia has increasingly become the consumer um, of luxury, of the luxury market itself, and propping up the European and American luxury brands. Um, certainly, if we just uh, were to pull out our phones, our smartphones, we'd know that the the not only the rare earth materials that are critical to batteries, but also our phones, but also the um, uh, the labor involved in assembling. These, these phones and devices uh, are in part interlocked uh, in the supply, main, uh, supply chain management system with um, factories and laborers in Asia. Um, so um, that interlocking of the economies is increasingly shifting towards some kind of uh, competition um, and enemy status. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little tricky because when we think of um, survival of the fittest and that kind of whole idea, that somehow the fittest survive. Well, it's not, it's, it's true to some degree because those who are considered too fit are then oftentimes racialized as somehow they have an unfair advantage. And they've therefore, it's not just that um, they were no longer 
they were not capable of competing in the past, which is oftentimes how many Asian cultures and peoples are thought of. But then once they learn, they become too imitative and they become too powerful because they're still ruled by some central despot or they're still ruled by some kind of um, foreign kind of racial drive uh, to be too imitative and to be too competitive. And they, that needs to be controlled or kind of pushed back in some way. Um, so I think we're in a very dangerous moment right now. And for the question of how do we, how can it tip back the other way? Um, I think what's really at stake with the, in the era of global warming and the question of alternative sources of power to replace the carbon economy that's really driving everything right now that's causing so much of the destruction, not just in terms of wind power and um, uh, uh, wind power and solar power, power, but also the way agriculture is done, which is depleting the soil itself. All those kinds of practices have to be reversed dramatically, as we know, uh, with the Paris Accords, but also the upcoming accords that are really saying that uh, the collapse, the cascading impact of the of the economy, but also the environment are upon us. And that every year we wait, and the longer we wait, the more impacts that the climate change effects, but also other effects are going to have. And they're going to they're going to fall on us before we realize it. I mean, we're already seeing that happen. But it's going to just get be the beginning of a much worse process and cycle. Uh, the pandemic, by the way, is included in that in terms of the development issues and how wild parts of nature are increasingly being impeded upon by development efforts and therefore the greater contact between those wild animals um, and humans than uh, crossing disease across species. Um, all those issues are at play here. And I think unless we begin to cooperate, unless we begin to not think of this as a, as a war between the good and the bad, and somehow the Chinese represent all the bad or the Asians, some new Asian enemy represents all the bad, unless we change that kind of thinking away from a binary good and bad idea to actually begin to think about how cooperation can actually happen to save, um, to save uh, human civilizations themselves, uh, unless that happens, we're in deep doo-doo, right? Um, mm -hmm. So uh, how do we do that? Um, that becomes a very important question. And it's one of the, I think the most important question that we, um, our children, our grandchildren need to take up. And it's one that our very livelihood, our very future, not just in the United States, but also yep. in China and other parts of the world have to take up um, unless we're just basically going to be at each other's throats more and more. So, Jack, uh, uh, I, uh, I know that we have scheduled only up to three o'clock. I want to make sure that you're OK. There's a couple more questions. Uh, sure. So yeah. you're OK no to problem. run, you know, 10, 15 minutes later. Yeah. Um, OK, so uh, one question that just came in is, I guess, you know, in recent years, you know, the term BIPOC uh, has really been very popular. And, and I think this uh, person who's asking the question also mentioned another term, people of the global majority. This is the first time I heard that term. Um, do, so he, she's asking, he or she is asking, do you, what do you think about Chinese Americans using these terms and, and what's gained and what's lost right, by using these terms? To yeah, point? well, um, it's a really good question. Um, I think it's important for Chinese Americans, Asian Americans, but also um, Asian peoples who are really start still part of the, the kind of global South. In other words, those the vast majority of people are not wealthy, uh, although we know the stereotype of Asians as somehow being wealthy, right? Um, but that there's different uh, ways of identification that really also speak to relationships of power and relationships to wealth. And, um, and that it's really important, I think, for the great majority of people from any group to understand that um, to identify um, with not just their group, let's say Chinese Americans mm -hmm. or Asian Americans, yep. but also to have multiple ways of understanding the nuances of that. So I think those of us who uh, have a lot of privilege, wealth, and power, and choices, um, need to be very humble about what that really means, um, and not assume that somehow that means we've been accepted into the big club, you know, <laughs> that um, right. there is larger spheres of wealth and power um, that can be of all uh, peoples from around the world, 
people are really making decisions that are not in our interests. So we don't want to be fooled by somehow the fact that there is an Asian person in some very powerful position thinking that they're automatically going to be looking out for us. But I think the term BIPOC is quite important, although I would reverse it. I know uh, as a term, as an acronym, BI is, is very, it's more uh, poetic and more effective, but it really should be indigenous, black, mm. and people of color. And I think our future has to be with grappling with that and understanding that. In other words, without understanding that the processes of dispossession and enslavement were twinned in the formation of the United mm. States and all immigrant and migrant groups who have then come into these regions since then uh, build on top of that uh, history. And oftentimes we don't understand it, we don't know it, but part of why I talk about political arithmetic and how power is actually part of that, it's not just some scientific usage of arithmetic, but it's actually power that's embedded in that, that's really about colonialism and, um, and how unfair um, and uneven development really happens. So BIPOC, I think, refers to, of course, the importance of, of Black Lives Matter, and indigenous people's uh, lives matter, and also how people of color are related and racialized differently in segments in relationship these, to these foundational kinds of questions. Um, so um, I think it is a global question of the global majority as well. Um, and in some ways, I think the idea of the 99% or the 99.9% .9 of the global peoples and the, and the needs for basic peoples uh, welfare in terms of housing, clothing, food, and safety for the great majority of people around the world is paramount right now. And there's never been a greater extreme of wealth and poverty and basically a skewing of the ability of that great majority of people to basically find a basic uh, a secure way of having good food and good health and all that. So we're, we're hitting that crisis point, especially with global warming and the crisis of pandemics, because we see on the one moment an interest in kind of a shared interest and a shared desire to try to take care of the society as a whole and to reduce these inequalities. But at the same time, we see this kind of virulent um, kind of move, uh, whether it be white supremacy or other kinds of moves of, of kind of a, a, a very narrow nationalism in which power is reasserting itself and pitting groups against each other within that uh, region or within that country or within that place. So um, the danger is around us and um, Trumpism cannot be understood as being isolated and somehow just particular to the personality of that person. But also there are problems with the way the Democrats have formed and committed themselves mm -hmm. as well. So I think we can't be too narrowly, again, connected to one party or another. We have to be really thinking and organizing in a broader way. And that's one of the ad additional reasons why BIPOC is, I think, actually a very important kind of concept. But we also have to understand it historically. It's not just an abstract idea. It's actually mm -hmm. a historically interlinked idea in which our fates have been always intertwined, but we didn't necessarily know it because the people in power were actually manipulating things around. But um, we who were, who were kind of subject to that, that, that kind of logic or political arithmetic weren't necessarily um, understanding of what that context was about. Um, but the railroads is actually a very important example of how it actually operated, but we yet to have the story of the railroads or the interlinked stories of that history fully understood and fully told. So that, that challenge uh, faces us and we have to do it. We have to begin that project mm -hmm. immediately. Okay, there's two more questions kind of about different uh, terms. Uh, I guess one, one question is asking, do you say you are Chinese hyphen American or Chinese no hyphen American? <laughs> so. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, my partner is a copy editor, and we've had long discussions about this over the years, but we do not use the hyphen. Um, and I think part of it is that the term hyphenated American uh, has been used historically as somehow representing a lesser American. So you're either American or a hyphenated American, and that automatically uh, kind of suggests a two-class kind of system of those who are uh, from some other place other than the Anglo-American world to be hyphenated. So in some ways, I feel that we have to counter map and counter use these terms to push 
against them to make it appear to make it understood that being an Anglo American, uh, maybe with a hyphen is actually something that we have to understand is the invisible American behind um, the claim that somehow you're either an American or hyphenated Americans. The only true Americans truly of this continent are indigenous peoples. So everybody else is hyphenated or not hyphenated. But I think it's important for us to not just stop there um, as a battle line, but also keep on going in terms of understanding where the historical problems actually are. Uh, another term that I actually personally have have some issue with is, is the word minority, right, which is oftentimes used because uh, I, I feel like it has a kind of a little bit of negative or inferior connotation. I don't know whether you agree with with that uh, that assessment. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, the reason why I think these terms majority and minority are so powerful in a democracy is that somehow if you're part of the majority, then you're part of the group that makes the decisions and you're part of the group that makes the norms. And um, that has been true, but we're also reaching the point very quickly where there's actually, um, there's no majority, there's a plurality of different blocks of populations who now defy the usual idea of what counted as a majority of the population that had the democratic decision-making power. So I think that's part of what's freaking people out right now. It's, it's like part of, the, uh, part of the nostalgic kind of desire to make America great again is really to make America where there's a clear white Protestant majority again, and that the threat of all these different groups uh, and Asian Americans we know along with uh, Latinx people, Latin Americans, Hispanic Americans are amongst the fastest growing numbers of people in the United States. There's a great fear that somehow if all of these groups conspire like in a bad Fu Manchu movie to unite against the white person, then they're going to be attacking the white woman and um, overcoming uh, the white man uh, in, in, in that kind of uh, yellow peril or black peril or whatever peril scenario. Um, so I think the processes and working of a democracy are far more complex than that. But I think that's where it's drawing upon a lot of strength in terms of the Republican Party, which seems to now be have decided that's a white nationalist party, and uh, by and large. Um, and that uh, if that's the formulation between a pluralist democracy represented by somehow by the Democratic Party and a white nationalist party represented by the Republicans. But in fact, both parties uh, still don't quite come clean in terms of how political arithmetic or how racism or whatever actually operates in both parties, then we're faced with not a very good choice. So I think that I think that our futures really depend not so much on how the parties align themselves with wealth and power, but actually we have to be educating ourselves and telling our own stories and begin to understand um, how things actually work. Um, so I, I think we have to, you know, I, I'm, I vote for, I voted for Biden and I will vote for Democratic candidates as long as their principles are good. Um, but oftentimes there's a limit as to how far they're mm -hmm. really willing to go in terms of tackling with the real issues of big pharma, for example. Yep. You know, I, I've taken the vaccine, but also big pharma is part of the problem of why we don't yep. have universal health care, right? So, so what are the real issues of democracy and fairness um, for all of us? Okay. So continue the uh, and questions on, in terms of terminologies. Uh, so <laughs> another term that, that uh, one of the question uh, coming from is, Man, he, she know, he, this person uh, noticed that a lot of younger generation are using the term fighting white supremacy, right? Quite dropping that, that word quite a bit uh, without understanding the term, fully understanding the term. So how would you talk about white supremacy and how do, you, how do we help the younger generation not to just drop the term without any context? Yeah, I mean, as I'm trying to suggest in the case of the Irish example, but we could say the same for Jews and Italians, for example, each of these groups have gone through a historical process in which they were not seen as white. The Irish because they're Catholic and the Protestants because they, the white Protestants thinking that they're the only true superior uh, people in Europe, for example. Uh, that's certainly true during the eugenics kind of framing of things, which also further reinforced the idea that 
the Alpines or the Central Europeans were somehow next, they were below and, and uh, not as good as the Nordics so-called, and that the worst of the, of the Europeans were the Mediterraneans, who um, part of it was that the Italians were also oftentimes represented as swarthy, were thought to be somehow intermixed with the Africans, you know, um, from the connection that many Italians had back and forth with uh, North Africa. Um, and that these were groups that had to be eliminated from the culture. Now that feeling and attitude is still strongly with the United States. I think um, Jews are seen as the honorary whites in some ways, as long as they are cooperating and really, um, really helping um, the kind of white Protestant elite interests. But it's an ongoing unresolved issue um, that uh, still, we still see anti-Semitism come back um, quite a bit with white supremacy. So, so the problem is, is that we need to make distinctions between who counts as white and how did that process actually happen? So that's why for me, going back to Irish colonialism is actually quite important because it gives us some perspective, historical perspective of how wealth and power operated in the building of the British empire that made the possibility for those very same ships to then carry the opium and uh, enact the slave trade that the Americans then took up, right? So those are really tough questions for us to take on because oftentimes, let's say um, school boards and school curriculum would not wanna tell those stories. But in fact, if we talk about a truthful history, we have to tell those stories, we have to involve them. So how do we do that? Um, that becomes part of the question. So it's not a simple matter of all white people were this way. Whiteness was itself a historical process that brought in more and more people as anti-blackness, as anti-Muslim, as anti um, quote unquote Mexican or anti-Hispanic or anti-Asian um, racialization processes happened, then the same racialization began to whitewash in effect those past histories in which Jews were seen hmm. as non-white, Italians were seen as non-white, and Irish were seen as non-white. So I think a lot of people who claim whiteness today, today actually don't know their own family stories and their own family histories, and just automatically feel defended if somehow they realize, well, I'm not Black, I'm not Asian, I'm not Latinx, so therefore hmm. I must be white. But in fact, if we look at people's stories, they're a real mixture of many of these backgrounds and they don't even know their own family histories and they don't know how their grandparents for example actually were oftentimes treated as non-whites and what the struggles they may have had so i think that lack of memory requires people to come to terms with their lack of understanding of their own histories themselves within their families um, and that in some ways white people i think oftentimes will feel that somehow they have no culture mm -hmm. um, and they they are not connected in some way but it's actually important to reconstruct all that. So, you know, with all the interest in 23andMe or with um, people tracing their own genealogies, I think that represents a very important effort and desire, but it also means that they need to begin to locate their own family stories within real histories and not some fantasy history of whether they're related to a king or to a princess or, or what. It's not just some kind of uh, com commodified way of identification, but actually some real understanding that if you're Irish and grew up in Boston, and then also your Irish family were anti-Black, the complexity of the dynamics of what that history really is about and a reckoning with both the racism within the family, but also how they were subject to British racism and colonialism at the same time. So I think it's really through that exploration of the honest history that we have a chance of actually coming to terms with questions of white supremacy hmm. and our involvement in it one way or another. So I think it's interesting that you bring in the topic of some of these other, you know, what is classified as white groups ultimately getting accepted. But I think one of the challenge of being Asian American and Chinese American is that we are seen kind of almost as a perpetual foreigner, right? They don't think, even though we have I, one example that I constantly use is I know folks who are, you know, I know I have a colleague who is fellow Russian, for example, he only came here, you know, past, you know, 10, 15 years. But if you walk on the street, like people would see that he's, you know, would treat him as American versus, you know, people like Tony Lee, for example, who's been here for, you know, four or five generations and, and might still be treated as foreigner. So do you see that uh, eventually Asian Americans will be accepted as, you know, will no longer be the perpetual foreigner and be, be 
accepted as, as, as American and what might it takes to, to get to that step, I guess. Yeah, no, that's, that's another big question. I mean, I think the price we pay for being accepted as Americans within the current system is a very great price to pay. In other words, mm -hmm. I think it would require us to play a role in being anti-Black and anti-Latinx and anti-Hispanic in a way that I think is pitting one group against each other. And I think that's right. where Don't part of the model minority representation and racialization happens, you know? Um, and I'm just thinking, how do we understand this historically? So the founding father of eugenics internationally was Sir Francis Galton, who, who coined the term eugenics in 1883. That was the year after the Chinese exclusion laws were passed in the US. And from a British vantage, he was talking, this is a, 1879 um, letter to the editor in a newspaper, in a British newspaper, he was suggesting that Chinese, that British should bring the Chinese to Africa, to colonize Africa, hmm. because the Chinese were so much more industrious and so much a better kind of um, uh, racial group than the Africans who are just indolent and lazy and uh, kind of backwards, right? So that um, there is no compunction from using Chinese laborers. In this case, we still can think about Chinese coolies who are used and South Asian coolies who are used um, and, and brought in large numbers to the Caribbean, but also Peru and other places of Europe other places, excuse me, in uh, in the world. I mean, South Africa, for example, is one place, but also the American South with Chinese laborers being brought into um, to, uh, manufacturing jobs, but also into growing rice crops, right? So this movement of large groups of racialized groups as a solution to, um, to the degradation and, and uh, degeneration of, 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 of that blacks supposedly brought to whites, right? The threatening quality um, was also an argument and also a logic that was used at the same time that Fu Manchu images were emerging and yellow parallelism was emerging. So I think it's not just one or the other, not becoming kind of the model minority or accepting the fact that, oh, we're flattered that um, Sir Francis Galton thinks that we should uh, be in Africa to improve Africa, right? And to, and to improve the world through Chinese being there. We can't, we can't uh, stop there. I and mean, this gets back to the BIPOC question. We have to understand these histories as interlinked and we can't get confused by that seeming compliment of somehow Chinese being harder workers than blacks and Africans and that's being somehow a solution to the world's problems. So um, the, we, we've, we've got to grapple with that kind of question and that can happen in the workplace where um, Chinese are generally not seen as leadership, but they can be promoted within a kind of severe hierarchy of the corporation to be in a position to manage the people of color who are there, you know? I mean, I'm not talking literally about that, but in some ways we can see Asians as kind of a middle ranking segmented hierarchy that never quite get to the top, but never really necessarily occupy the bottom, which are occupied by the people who are the janitors and the people who are the guards of any company. So I, I think I make the final two questions is one that came in that's very interesting, uh, also on the labeling. Uh, as many Chinese Americans are marrying out of the community, now you have many kind of biracial, multiracial, you know, my, myself as an example of that. Um, what terms should we use for the, for the children? Uh, I mean, there's obviously Eurasian is probably, and then Hapa, transracial, mixed heritage. Do you have an opinion on, on, on that uh, dynamic? Um, I don't. I mean, I think people need to name themselves in the way they think is, um, is accurate and resonant. Um, but uh, so, you know, if, if one identifies with um, black culture, one is black and, and uh, Vietnamese, for example, which, or black and Korean, which may come out of a wartime situation, um, then um, I think it's really important not to simply be ashamed in the US context for being black, um, but also how we have to reckon with the fact that in any mixture, we may appear to be one more than the other. Mm -hmm. And that somehow we may want to try to pass as that other group that gives us some advantage and less embarrassment. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to identify in a way that is proudly 
acknowledging and recognizing the complexity mm. of that mixture. And in fact, all people are mixes. I mean, there's no yep. such thing as a pure right. people, right? Chinese yep. are mixtures to begin with, right? Yep. Um, and, and white Anglo-Saxon Protestants are mixtures to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, but there is this kind of uh, narrowing within a highly racialized society of having to choose and trying to pass or have advantage of one identification or another. I think that's tragic. I think people mm. come to terms with the stories, the real stories of both sides and all sides of their families. And that's important. I think it's important for us to come to terms with that. Um, yep. Then how we name ourselves is also a tricky question because the fiction of passing is always hiding. I mean, this is where the film Gattaca, uh, I, I encourage everybody to watch mm -hmm. the film Gattaca, for example, if you haven't seen that film, it's really a fantastic film because it's really trying to pass as someone who's acceptable and, try, and the life that one begins to take on in trying to pass, it consumes one's ability to actually be that person who is actually that, the, the real person that's actually there. And that consumption of that all consuming feeling of passing then really dehumanizes a way of de self dehumanizing because one is trying to uh, act and behave in the way that the dominant culture and society expects one to. Mm -hmm. And then therefore the ability to actually come to terms with one's actual background is not there. Now, I just say that in the context of eugenics because eugenics was also about race mixing. The idea was that somehow if a Nordic person falls in love with an Italian, God forbid, okay, <laughs> that, that their children are going to be racially degenerated to the level of the Italians, so that you have to have the proper marriages. And Chinese culture is this way too, you know, traditional Chinese culture, that you have to have the proper families marrying each other. And that's what the future is by trying to maintain a purity of the future, right? So, um, so we're caught within those kinds of, that kind of hall of mirrors. And I think a lot of the wealthy and traditional families that come from China, for example, or come from Asia, are trying to uphold those kinds of values and traditions in a way that are not necessarily very healthy for the actual children or grandchildren that are there. Right. I think it does a real violence and uh, creates trauma in all sorts of ways or microaggressions in all sorts of ways that are very, very unhealthy. Right? Mm -hmm. For, for the future generations. And that's where Tani, you know, in terms of what can we take from Tani, he's concerned, I think, about the future generations. He's mm -hmm. that fourth generation where he knows the three generations that came before him mm -hmm. and the three generations after him. And that's the role that each of us play. How are we thinking about the past? And how are we thinking about the future and keeping the health and well being of those seven generations alive and thinking about what's the best position we should take? for our great grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean in terms of positions about global warming or positions about stocks that one may be investing in? One might be short-term gain, but the other consequence of that is actually a long-term destruction of the very world that we're hoping that they will flourish in. Okay. So I guess back uh, down to the final question. <laughs> Thank you for spending <laughs> extra time with us. Sure. Uh, and uh, I guess is, is regarding, you know, the roles of historical societies like ourselves and other museums like MOCA that you're involved with. Um, how can, you know, we help to kind of not repeat the history, historical stereotypes and how can we be better funded? Now, for the longest time, I think, you know, organizations like us, nobody really, I mean, unless you were passionate, you know, about history, uh, getting very little attention. Uh, and hopefully, I mean, I, things are hopefully changing but i just want to get your view of, of how what roles we should pay and how can we get better funded in general yeah well i mean i think i think a key is getting the word out um better and uh tapping into people's real needs and the multi-generational strategies that we have to have so that um how can each organization be thinking about telling a true and accurate story that really does speak to where people are at and the complexity or is not just flattering or somehow um, uh, self-absorbed, but actually grappling with the real problems that we're facing within everyday life. So that I think on the one hand, we have to acknowledge the Chinese American and different aspects of Asian American stories and the complexity of that. So of those of mixed heritage families, you know, if you're Japanese American and Korean, um, how do we grapple with those stories that that person really has to deal with in that in their life 
in an honest way that really speaks to them so that they feel that the history that's being told actually is really is true is truly compelling and helping them grapple with an understanding right so i think that's really important for the historical societies to do and then the difficulty is that if we do that oftentimes it's not necessarily the best branding strategy mm -hmm. in the world right because people right. don't necessarily want to hear bad things or feel that if you're dealing with something more complicated, then you're not going to be able to raise the money. I think there's a moment of change right now where a lot of the foundations are trying to reckon with mm -hmm. uh, a more accurate and truthful history and they're trying to, yep. they're being challenged about the racism. So I think in some ways at this moment, it's actually a good way, it's a good time to start applying <laughs> to some of those mm -hmm. places, but one has to embody the true values yep. of a anti-racist, anti-white supremacist kind of future and do that with that intentionality and that honesty uh, to be able to uh, gain those funds. Uh, at the same time, we know that um, that could shift. And if the past president resume, comes back as a president, then in many ways, we're in a very dangerous period. And how do organizations flourish during that kind of time period? Is it by somehow accommodating and adjusting to those values? I don't think that's a good alternative. So how do we build in times that are good, but also times that are dangerous? It is a real question about how do you strategize and how do you apply what you've learned from other parts of your life? And you know, I know that the Chinese Historical Society of New England has a wealth of uh, experience because you've got many amazing people who know a lot and have done well in different parts of their lives, whether they're a Chinese laundryman family or whether they're from they're working in some corporation. Um, how, how do you bring that wealth together and actually develop a strategy together that actually can be as smart as um, the survival strategies of mm. the families and contexts that we're within? I think that becomes a challenge. It takes time, but I think those developing those deeper relationships with this historical society has a great deal of a lot of you all know each other um, developing those relationships and developing an honest critical understanding of strategies of how to move into the future mm -hmm. i think is the key to success so well with that uh thank you jack for <laughs> spending you know time with us today all you know very insightful uh, conversation uh, I just want to remind everyone, uh, the next event that we have is in December, which is our annual meeting uh, where we'll be honoring uh, uh, yeah, two the distinguished member of the community. Uh, the next Tani Lee event uh, will actually happen uh, in January uh, as we kick off a new series to celebrate the 150 years of Chinese students in America. Because uh, as, as most of you know, the Chinese education mission was launched in 1872. So, uh, so we will actually feature a panel with three different uh, academics uh, on the three of the Chinese Ameri education mission students who actually stayed behind in America, namely Hong Yan Chang, who's a, who was a lawyer who actually was not admitted to the California bar, but then you know ultimately uh, because of the, the exclusion uh, laws at the time, uh, but ultimately there was an effort to, to get him admitted uh, uh, later on. Uh, and then uh, Yan Fu Li, who is uh, probably the first Chinese American author, uh, published uh, and, and book editor. And then uh, there's also uh, Yong Kuai, who was a diplomat who happened to live. Uh, so we will basically feature those three and talk about their lives and their careers. Uh, so stay tuned. And um, but thank you everyone for spending time with us this Saturday. And I look forward to seeing you at our next event. So thank you. <laughs>